Unit 7 starts in the 1950s. The 1950s had followed a, almost a decade of war for the United States and the rest of the world. That was a decade of tumult and extreme artistic change. The 1950s, often thought of as a rather sleepy decade, were not musically. They saw the rise of rock and roll and its close brother, rhythm and blues. And they saw a revitalization of America's Iberian heritage, the third prong of its triple heritages, in the form of mambo and samba crazes, as well as Latino rock. The 1950s, despite being peaceful, were an extension of something known in America <coughs> as Jim Crow laws. The Jim Crow laws had originated after the Civil War, but had intensified for the hundred years following that. By 1950, musicians were finally breaking some of the Jim Crow social barriers that infested the United States. Musicians had been segregated by law in most states where white musicians and black musicians could play on the same records and on the same radio stations, but they could not appear together live. Rock and roll and R&B changed that. Actually, it wasn't called R&B then. It was called rhythm and blues but it was very much related to R&B that would resurface in the 70s and 80s. The main cities in the development of rock and roll were Memphis, Chicago, and New York City, some of our old city friends here. Memphis was probably the most important. In that one city was established a legendary recording studio called Sun Records. Sun Records in Memphis, Tennessee was a studio that was solely responsible for the beginning careers of such world famous artists as Elvis Presley, Carl Perkins, Roy Orbison, and B.B. King. They even recorded the first record for Jackie Brinston, a nom de plume, a fictitious name adopted by one young man named Ike Turner who would go on to become a Motown producer and the husband of superstar Tina Turner. The 50s were an exciting time. And they demonstrated the strength of American capitalism in the performing arts. In other words, the performing arts in America started to become institutionalized as part of America's business. Major labels flourished in the 1950s, and so did independent labels. The life of the artist was still tough. It was still a matter of driving from radio station to radio station with a trunk full of your singles, your 78s or your 45s, and getting them on air sometime. On air was critical. America was really starting to listen to that new invention, the radio. The AM radio in this case, FM radio, was postponed until the 1960s. We'll get there. But artists began to understand whether they were black or white or Latino, that entertainment and recording music was a way of life. The 1950s extended into the 1960s. In fact, that's going to be the case in our class for the next few decades, that the decades don't change on the zeros, they'll change on the fives. But what we see then in the 1950s is the institutionalization of America's commercial music, of America's popular music into an industry that by the 1960s and on until today will rank as the second greatest sector of America's gross national product.